let you say it this evening. Uh, good evening, everybody. Welcome to Orthodoxy Questions and Answered. Oh, all right. I thought you were going to, I was, I thought you were going to open it up in that, um, in that St. Petersburg style of Dr. Paul Bearer. Remember that? Oh my God. You know, <laughs> oh, good evening and welcome to well, another frightful night with Dr. Paul Bearer. Now, you'd have to be from Florida to actually understand that joke, right? Well, every state, every state had its own version of Dr. Paul Bear. Yeah, I mean... Uh, creature feature. Creature feature, mm -hmm. Svengoolie, right? So we all, yeah. each one had their own kind of... Uh, what, what, what did you... Did You had... Uh, you were in Orlando. Did you have Dr. Paul Bear for the no, Fright I, I, Nights? I don't, Saturday? I don't remember that at he all. He was pretty old by then. Mm. Dr. Paul Bear would have been really old. Yo, okay. I, I'm just wondering, in all your years of doing this show, what makes you think that she would have started the show like that? I don't know. I just That just came into my head. You know, stuff just comes into my head. We know that. <laughs> <laughs> Let's move on. <laughs> Hello, everybody. <laughs> well, welcome to uh, another evening of Orthodoxy, Orthodoxy Q and A. Um, all right. Any idea what? Uh, I think we, I think we do, uh, we do have one thing that we want to talk about, right? Just acknowledge, um, you know, that we uh, we all pray for uh, Bishop. Oh, Mar Mari. Uh, Mar Mari. Uh, regardless of regardless of what uh, of what we uh, of what we we think or of uh, of. Him versus Orthodoxy versus Catholicism. Uh, it was a terrible and horrible thing uh, for him to be uh, stabbed like that. And certainly, uh, upon seeing that, our prayers instantly went out to uh, went out to him. Um, he he was. Uh, I mean, it was not life threatening. So uh, it sounds like he uh, he will recover. There were some of his parishioners also that I think suffered from that attack too. So it just um, it it shows what uh, Jesus Christ has been telling us is that, you know, times are going to get tough. We're not saying that, uh, trying to say this is the end times, but certainly we can see that, uh, that, you know, times are, are getting, are getting tough and it's getting more difficult to, uh, to be not only in this country, but in other countries, uh, to, uh, to be Christian. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. They said that, uh, well, I don't know if it's true. Someone commented, that um, the I guess it was a switchblade. It didn't open all the way. Right, right. So if and it that, had, if it had, it didn't and, open properly. So right? if it had opened so, properly, I think it would have been a different story. So, commentary from the peanut uh, gallery. Yeah, well, ninety minutes isn't enough. So, <laughs> <laughs> did you want to uh, talk about your big news of today? Um, so we uh, so we now have we now have uh, the Orthodox Catechism book uh, available. Um, so uh, we've uh, we just we just got it uh, finished up. Um, just want to move that. I can see your hand hitting oh, it. Okay. So we just got this uh, finished up. So we'll be having this available now. Uh, this is a, a book on uh, a handbook. And again, uh, can't take the engineering out of out of the boy. I mean, you know, it's a handbook. Mm -hmm. um, and the idea. As I said in my uh, said in my introduction, uh, is that it serves two purposes. Uh, number one, uh, it's an organized catechism, so that when people come to church and they want to undergo a catechism process, there's at least you know a formula. I'm, again, mathematical got to be all right. There's a formula, but even more, there's more in this than than a catechumen is going to need uh, just for his or her catechumen process. So there's just some questions and things out that came that have come out of our orthodoxy questions and answers, the the chats, um, the questions related to our 101 and um, uh, what's the other series that we do? It's it's oh factor fiction, factor fiction, and Tartan and priest and uh, among many others. Right. So we've gotten a lot of questions out of that, and so I tried to combine compile them in here so that. It can go beyond catechism, and it can just be a reference guide for just questions that you have. Um, you know, what's the holy water font for? Where did it come from? Uh, what is? Uh, how do I talk about intercessory prayer with my Protestant brethren? Uh, what's the scoop on icons? 
Um, do we have to bless the home every year? So uh, just a series of questions kind of in the vein. You I haven't see. even gotten a question and you're already standing up. Maybe we need a bell sound every yeah. time he stands up or a, a squeaky spring or something. I can make arrangements. <laughs> so kind of in the, in the style of uh, Father Stanley Harakis's famous uh, book, uh, what is it? Um, uh, I think 455 questions, contemporary moral issues. He focused on on contemporary moral issues, but you know, it's it's something that you can just look up a particular question and then see what the church's answer is. So it's kind of styled after that. So anyway, that's so it's available on Amazon. Yes, and, there's a link in the description. Yes, and then uh, we will have some here. Not once they come, you had to order them and have them sent here. But once we get them, there will be books available locally. Correct. Right. Mm -hmm. Probably some as uh, prizes for show number 200. Show number 200. Okay. Which show are we on now? 173? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, yeah, in 30, if you can wait 30 weeks. 30. <laughs> oh, well, hopefully we'll have the, the books by then. I think they're supposed to come in late. Oh, maybe show 175. <laughs> One, yeah, that's right. <laughs> All yeah. right. Okay. Um, anything else? I think that's it. Mm, all right. Well, we did, uh, before we even begin, we did get a question submitted um, on Sunday. Let me pull that up from Alex Plays, who wanted uh, to ask, um, when you swing the sensor, um, how doesn't the incense and uh, coal fall out? Especially since you have a very unique way of doing it. You flip it upside down and so forth. How does it not fall out? Um, As an engineer, I think you also might have a... I think, yeah, so uh, so I, I, I think uh, thanks to the physics of centrifugal force, right? right. So swinging the sensor, uh, you know, or swinging any object um, with, a, uh, uh, with an appropriate force um, will keep it, uh, keep it attached. It's kind of the same idea as the ride where the platform falls out, you know, the one that spins around, right? And then the platform falls out, right? But you're still held in place. What is that called? Population control? <laughs> I, I, I the wrote gravitron, that you mean? Is that what that like thing was called? Gravitron? I, I, and never... then it goes up and down too. It seems it's a big at the, at the, amusement, at the, amusement yeah, it's the big parts. circle and it goes fast. Fast, yeah, they, right? But then the bottom falls out. I've never seen the bottom fall out. Oh, yeah, yeah. We're, we're veering off. Course. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. So, sorry. All right. But yeah, uh, you know, centrifugal force uh, will uh, we'll keep that in. However, if you look closely, um, on uh, so the next time Demos zooms in on either the steps going up to the Slaya or right past the Vima, uh, which is the the just the carpeted area just in between the Vima, which is that marble step, and then the altar, you'll see two nice round burn marks where it did not work as well as I had thought. It's probably the early days when you weren't. Yeah. Swinging it hard enough. Yeah, well, that's right. I wasn't as practiced, so. <laughs> All right. So that's why our altar boys are very, very brave. <laughs> <laughs> they stay away, too. That's right. <laughs> and Minimal 15 feet. To, no, I'm just kidding. Okay. And, and I have them inspect the chains, too, every once in a while, just to make sure. Because I did have the chain break one time on me, and, you know, and it oh. worked. So the thing tipped over and the, everything flew out. So, oh. yes, everything must be tested. Are you ready to jump in? I'm, uh, oh, uh, there is another question, uh, but let's go ahead and, and uh, it's uh, uh, one, of our, one of our viewers, Veronica, uh, had two questions she wanted to ask. So I want to put these in, but let's go ahead and ask a couple of questions okay. first and then. All right. First up, cooking with bee bug. Hello, Father Angelo and team. Hope all is well. What is the Orthodox view on the destination of a soul that was Orthodox by practice but not known if they were baptized before death. Will they enter heaven or not? And was any sacrament taken invalid? All right. I just got to hear the first part again. Okay. What is the Orthodox view mm -hmm. on the destination of a soul right. that was Orthodox by practice, but it was not known if they were baptized before death? Will they enter heaven or not? And was any sacrament that was taken invalid? All right. So, um, so a, a very simplistic answer, kind of like an iceberg. 
you have a very simple answer, but then there's this whole iceberg that sits below the sea that you got to talk about and explain. Mm -hmm. All right. So the the person the person followed the Orthodox faith. Okay. So then 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 we believe that he lives in the he lived in the body of Christ and continues to live in the body of Christ. So we can say we can say that again. You know, the Orthodox don't make the statement about you know who goes to heaven, who goes to hell. Right? We don't make a statement like that. But what he did promise us is, if you abide in me, I will abide in you. So he did make that promise. And so from that standpoint, yes, there's. I'm going to relate it to this really interesting story that uh, that I had heard. Um, uh, oh, and I'm trying to remember now uh, how it goes, but it focused on this uh, this one gentleman who really didn't know the actual prayers. So he kind of prayed whatever he thought, you know. And then the question was, he's not praying the right prayer. He's not saying it right. And the other monk said, well, but his heart is in the proper place. And so, you know, so he is seen as righteous before God. So it's that same type of same type of thing. Okay. So the Orthodox Church says that yes, uh, the practice of the Orthodox Church is baptism. All right. But we understand that, you know, sometimes things happen, you know, in uh and People can pass away before the actual sacrament has been ad administrated, ad administered. So we don't make the statement to say, well, that person is automatically excluded, but we look at the life that they led, that, that they have led. And so from that, we can say that certainly God will show mercy on them and recognize the life that they had. That, that uh, sh as St. James says, you know, show me uh, works right without works your faith is your faith is dead and he doesn't mean works of the law obviously but he means those acts of charity that Jesus has commanded us to do okay all right I'll come back to the uh, cooking's next uh, oh yeah he's supposed to be telling me what uh, what what cooking he does or kind she of we do does. we know if oh he or she, she? we don't right. know who that is well their uh, second question is technically from their dad. So. Oh, okay. So technically, it's a separate question. Okay. Technically. All righty. Um, so uh, Cooking with B-Bug's dad would like to ask why some Orthodox churches have a patriarch like Russia and some have a metropolitan such as Macedonia. What's the difference? And is there a difference in authority over the church? Um, so, so most Every ch Orthodox church has a patriarch, meaning that they have a mother church. Even if they are autocephalous, like Greece, they came from a mother church. Every church has a mother church, all right? But some have been granted autocephaly, so their archbishop is the highest authority there, okay? And in those that are autonomous, meaning that they have a mother, they have obedience to a mother church, but they can administer themselves, then they have, they all have patriarchs. All right. As far as governance and authority goes, you have to remember that rather than a vertical structure of the Catholic Church, the Orthodox Church is, is horizontal. And so what that means is that the geographically speaking, the local bishop is the highest level of authority. So although we have an Archbishop of America, although our mother church is Constantinople and we have a patriarch, Bartholomew, the highest level of authority is, in this case, the Metropolitan of Detroit. Okay, So every bishop is a bishop. And so someone outside of that geographical area cannot tell our bishop what it is that he can and cannot do within his diocese. Okay. Um, our next question is from Costa, but kind of in along the same lines as what you just said, Costa has a fun fact about um, Metropolitan, I believe is what they meant to say. A new Metropolitan of Ireland was announced soon to be ordained in that brand new position. Wow. Okay. So, uh, so in that case, uh, the the uh, there is the Archbishop of Thigatiria, which is of the United Kingdom. So, uh, so I'm I'm wondering then, 
It, did he say bishop, not archbishop, right? Just said um, metropolitan. Oh, metropolitan. So under that archbishop then, and I, when I say under, again, we're understanding kind of what I mean, is then just like we have a bishop of Detroit, of Atlanta, then now he has probably, uh, well, there is a bishop of Ireland. I wonder if there's a bishop of Scotland. Hmm. Metropolitan. Uh, metropolitan. Sorry, metropolitan. Okay. I don't know. I guess uh, we'll find out. So well, congratulations. Um, so Costa asks, regarding confession, who can hear a confession? A priest? A monk? Can an abbess hear a confession? Um, so uh, tip because it is a sacrament, um, typically the confession will be heard by either a priest or a bishop. All right. Now I know that that there is that there are um, there are some some uh, I don't want to say exemptions, but there are some uh, e some economia, as we would say, uh, in the monasteries, especially where, uh, especially in a uh, in a convent. Again, we don't call them convents, but in a convent where there is not necessarily an on-site priest. Okay, okay? so the um, uh, so the uh, the mother superior or the abbess, okay, uh, can hear confessions, but it's the priest that has to come in and grant the absolution. So the sacrament of absolution can only be granted by the bishop or the or the priest. So so but typically in the men's monastery there is a priest monk and that is the person that will hear confessions and grant absolution. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Storm Shadow asks if Orthodox don't support destroying the body, how is burial at sea permissible? So if Orthodox do not support destroying the body, such as cremation, yeah. how is burial at sea permissible? Well, because the body will naturally decay, right? So we, that, that's what we want, is we want the natural decay process to take over. Well, I'm thinking that they may be thinking that, I mean, you put it in the water, there are sea creatures that will probably... Um, oh, we'll, uh, we'll eat it. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Yeah, but if you put it underground, the don't the worms, worms eat it? And, right, and so forth. well, that's true. Yeah. Yes, so. and they usually wrap. Well, I guess the wrapping may not stay on, but usually they're wrapped. So, um, but it is a natural way. I mean, it's, it's right. There's a there's a natural process of decay. I mean, there's nothing we can do to stop insects, you know, and and other creatures from uh, uh, um, what I want to say uh, from destroying the body. But it's but it's not done in the destructive purposeful manner that it was done in the like in the in the bible where they cast it out for it to be meat and food for the wild animals i mean that was done on purpose when we bury somebody at sea we're not we're not making them shark bait i mean like you said they're being wrapped they're the body's treated with respect but it will undergo the natural decay process okay um, let's see. Our next one is from Sonia Rizkala, I believe. What does it mean to commune with God? So we're really getting to the uh, we're really getting to the idea of of theosis. We're getting to the core of of theosis, and the idea is that and and this is really where uh, Saint Gregor of, of Palamas. Uh, um, took our theology, or again, remember, the Holy Fathers did not create new theology. They did not evolve theology. The theology was always there. What they did was help to uncover it, to, to reveal what is the mystery behind it, okay? Not the total mystery, but the mystery. And what did, what did he say? Is he said that prayer and contemplation and Askesis, which means which means ascetical exercise, provides us the opportunity to participate in God's energies, but not His essence, so that it's not, and so that we, in our highest state, which is what the monks achieve, is that we can participate in that uncreated light that was seen at the Transfiguration on Mount Tabor. So that's what we can participate in, but that's a very, very long road. 
to be able to do that. And that's done, that's done through the monastic efforts of prayer, fasting, uh, and contemplation mm-hmm. and, and uh, uh, discrimination. Discrimination in a good sense. <laughs> oh, I was going to say discrimination. What does that mean? Okay. Uh, dis- dis- discernment would be the better way. Oh, okay. Dis- discriminating between the voices that you hear. All right. That makes sense. Uh, Manos says, hi, Father. My name is Manos. I was baptized Greek Orthodox. However, I made a mistake to be a born-again Christian, and I, and, and I was baptized into another faith. I now want to revoke the baptism and come back to Orthodoxy. Can you please inform me what needs to be done? So, hey, would, it, would yeah. it be a chrismation? Well, would there be some penance? There would be some like, yeah. confession, and then you right. So there would be there would be you know a small catechism because he was born Orthodox. So there'd be a small catechism to discover what his true motivation is. Okay, he can't certainly can't be rebaptized, right? Um, the question about the question about the um, see this is this is a, a, a difficult question. If he was baptized as a youth, as a youth, as a young child, then he was more than likely chrismated. Okay, so that process happens once. So more than likely, what would happen is through catechism we would ask him if he has renounced his, uh, his former beliefs and his former practices and agrees to accept obedience into the Orthodox Church. And then through confession and uh, penance, he would be received back into the Orthodox Church. So I don't see, I don't see where there would be a need for chrismation because he's already had that sacrament performed, but he has strayed and excommunicated himself, and now he's received back through the sacrament of confession. Okay. Um, Sam Zivi asks, when do priests have to wear their cassock? Um, That's, you know, great, uh, great question. Typically, the cassock is the working uniform of the priest. So typically... Any time that the priest is not performing his sacramental duties as a priest, he should be wearing the cassock. And here I am not wearing the cassock. So how do we explain that? So the way that we explain that is that in certain countries like America, this is an authorized clerical uniform. So it's not the only clerical uniform, but it is authorized for use in the United States. All right. So you'll see many and you know, I mean, uh, uh, my uh, my my classmate, Father Athanasios. Right. Mm -hmm. He will always wear a cassock. That's how he that's how he goes out. Father, uh, Father Tom. There's a couple of Toms, which uh, Newland, Newland, Father Tom Newland. He'll be in a cassock. Father Anthony, you pretty much see him in a cassock. But some of the older priests, like uh, my spiritual father, Father Dean Huntales, though they typically did not wear the cassock, right? They wore they wore clothing similar to this. Mm-hmm. But yes, the pretty typically the uniform, the clerical uniform is the cassock. And sometimes you do wear the cassock on here. It's been a while, but you have yeah. worn it. And in fact, every time that I make the Sunday school videos, I make the shorts, I make, for the most part, I'm wearing the cassock for those. Mm-hmm. Yes, unless there's a reason not to. Right, right. Yeah. All right. Uh, did you want to ask um, Veronica's question? or? Oh, so. Um, so <laughs> Veronica's question is uh, kind of a two-part. All right. So number one, um, does God speak to us in similar ways today and we're unable to hear or perceive him? Or because Jesus Christ has already resurrected and ascended to heaven, how does the Lord now speak to us? Okay, so the, uh, so the question is interesting because, um, and, and uh, uh, Dr. Uh, and Father and Dr. Eugene Pentiuk of the, uh, of the seminary, he was my Old Testament professor there, um, and the way that he states it is that God has slowly receded in terms of his voice. 
Okay, so so he directly, or we believe that through Scripture, he directly spoke to Adam and Eve. So he talked to them as I'm talking to you right now. Okay, and then with the other patriarchs, like Noah, he spoke to them. But what we see as we move through Holy Scripture, we see that God's voice recedes until we get to the point of Elijah, and we see that in, in Elijah's case, he is not that booming loud voice. He is now present in the silence of the wind. And so that's, that's how he's heard. So, so God appeared many times in dreams. Now, with the coming of Jesus Christ, he spoke directly to his son. And remember, some of those people were not able to perceive that because many times in Scripture it says, and they thought they heard thunder, or they, heard, they thought that there was an angel speaking, so they were not able to discern that that was God's voice. Okay, So it wasn't God speaking to us as he spoke in, the, in Hebrew Scripture, he was speaking directly to his son, and some people heard the voice of God and other people did not. So what we have now is that God speaks to us more in a prophetic fashion, meaning that he speaks to us, um, in he can speak to us in visions, he can speak to us through angels, he can speak to us through the saints, the Theotokos, or that he can speak directly to us, but Remember, God, God's word, the Logos, is Jesus Christ. So this now is who speaks to us, and that's what Veronica brings out here. Because Jesus Christ has already resurrected and ascended to heaven, he is the one that speaks to us. And he says, I have, and, and now I give you the Holy Spirit so that you may be guided through him. So this is the voice also that we hear that also accuses us, but also guides us, and that's the Holy Spirit. All right. All right. She has one more, but we'll do. We'll take that one a little bit later. Okay. Um, Nick T says bonjour from Montreal, Canada. Oh. Uh, Father, your blessing. Can you please clarify which woman anointed Jesus with expensive oil on Holy Wednesday? The Bible footnotes of Matthew twenty six four says probably the sister of Martha. Some Greek Orthodox say Mary Magdalene. So, just look here. Matthew 26, 4. <laughs> okay. uh, you oh, you don't want to go to Matthew? No, uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look first in, first in John. Um, okay. Okay, and that is because I'd always heard it was Mary Magdalene. So I'm curious to see what um, the Bible yeah, says. That's what I, what I heard as well. Yeah. Okay, so here in and I'm reading from John chapter 12. Then six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus, who was dead, of whom he had raised from the dead, and there they made him a supper. Martha served. And then Mary took a pound of costly ointment. This makes us think it's the Martha and Mary of, uh, do you not know that only one thing is needful? This is a different Mary. Now we go to Matthew. Matthew 26. 26, 4. Twenty-six, three. Okay. And when Jesus was in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, a woman came to him having an alabaster flask, of, and she poured it on the. She poured it on him as he sat. But when the disciples saw this, they were indignant. Okay. So here we have. You're keeping us in suspense. Okay. <laughs> All right. Because of her fervent faith, Jesus promises the public memory of this woman. There is no consensus among the fathers as to her identity in relation to accounts of similar events in John and in Luke. 
Some fathers say that there were three different women in these four accounts. Others say that there were only two. So the answer is unresolved. Because there was, uh, at the cross, wasn't there Mary? Was it Mary, wife of Cleopas? Something right. Something like that. Mm -hmm. wonder, which I'd never heard that name before. So it sounds like the two Marys were there, right? Mary, and then the Mary, the mother of the right of, of Clopas, right? So in John, it seems to be the Mary of Martha and Mary, okay? Over in Matthew, it seems to be now, um, it, it's he, she's unnamed, okay? All right? But, uh, so we're not sure, but then you go, then you go to, uh, but then you go to Mark, and Mark seems to indicate that it might be Mary Magdalene. But, the, reading the commentary from the Orthodox Study Bible, we do not have a Orthodox solid consensus. Unresolved, but her name probably began with M. M. Her <laughs> name began with M. Yes. Not James Bond's boss, of course. <laughs> Steve Lenores, could you go through Holy Week and explain it? I'm your recent catechumen, and this is my first time through it. Well, that's a whole, that's a whole show on its own. So, I, so what I would strongly suggest, what I strongly suggest, you know, I'm uh, I'm marketing here. <laughs> All right, again. You have a handbook of Holy Week. I have a handbook of Holy Week. Yes, I do. And in fact, if you go, so the quickest thing to do is to go to our website, okay, and under education. All right, the very first thing under education will be catechism. All right, and when you go to catechism and you go to session nine, I have a chapter entitled Services of Lent and Holy Week, and it talks about what is what happens and what is the purpose of each one of the days. I think that's the quickest answer to uh, t to that. Yes, and that is that is free to access yeah. as a resource mm -hmm. on our website. Yep. So in a nutshell... Sunday, Monday, Tuesday are the bridegroom services, and what is the theme of bride of the theme of bride watchfulness? Of watchfulness. So the th the themes of the first three days. Well, Palm Sunday is his entry, right, mm -hmm. where he proclaims he accepts the title of Messiah and King. Then Sunday night, Monday and Tuesday the, is the the watchfulness. Wednesday is receiving of holy unction. Thursday is is recounting the story of his passion, uh, of, of the end of his passion week. Friday is his funeral service. And then Saturday is his protianastasy where he descends into, into Hades. And then his, obviously his resurrection service. All right. And then, uh, Sunday is the agape service, but right. Okay. Sunday of life. All right. Uh, very good. Um, Shelley, um, I'm not sure. Um, Poos? I'm Puck. not sure. Puck? Yeah. Puck? Hello. How can I make a prayer corner properly? Oh, I, think, oh. I think it's Shelly. Okay. Shelly. Sorry. I said she Shelly, but that's not how it's spelled. Or Shaley. Shaley. Sorry. I, I, I mispronounced it. And we lost him again. We lost him. <laughs> okay. He's going to assemble a prayer corner for you right here live. <laughs> right here live. You know what I... DIY, know, right? Yes. <laughs> DIY, that's right. Oh, you know what? Well, uh, Something tells me that his boxing figure probably won't end up in the, in <laughs> no, the prayer corner. Probably not. <laughs> oh, you know what? I, uh, I, used them, I used them all up. So... Well, in a, in, 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 in very a nutshell. Succinct, I, yes. In, okay, so... Okay, so... Some type of icon, all right? And then you'll have a, uh, a small sensor. That's what I was looking for. I guess I used them all up. A uh, small sensor that, that you can put your incense in, okay? And the charcoal that the incense goes on. And the, uh, and the charcoal that the incense goes on. And also some type of candlelight. So, mm -hmm. uh, what do they call those little tea, tea, tea lamps? Tea candles. Tea, tea lights. Tea, tea lights. lights. So, so just a, just a tea light. So you'd have the tea light in front of your icon. Uh, the other way to do it is if you just have like uh, just a little bit of oil and you have the, the floaty, right? The floaty. It's, it's the floating wick. Floating wick. <laughs> a floating wick. All right. And you put that in front of the icon 
And then over to the side, you have your uh, sensor then with your incense. And so you light the incense when you're going to do your evening or morning prayers. Right. And then some people have a particular corner in their house set up and they'll have multiple icons. Not, I mean, you can have only one, but some, a lot of people have more than one icon. Maybe it's their name day. Um, it, it could be anything. And so. Right. Uh, yeah. I mean, normally speaking, you'd have some type of icon of Christ for sure. Mm -hmm. But then you're, like you said, you'd have an icon of your saint. Yes. All right. okay. We have uh, a super chat from uh, Tommy Williams. Uh, hello, Tommy. Can a priest uh, consecrate a new church or just a bishop? Likewise, if a church closes, closes is it unconsecrated? Okay, so the answer to the first question is only the bishop can consecrate a church. So that is not within the priest's wheelhouse, as they say. Um, churches are never unconsecrated, okay? Um, I can give you the example of what happened uh, in, in Flint, because, uh, because I was there uh, when we moved our church, okay? So what has to be removed, that is the consecrated item, is the um, altar, okay? So normally what happens, there's, uh, there's a number of things that can be done, uh, several things that can be done. One, which is usually the most popular, is that the altar is moved to the new location of the church. The second thing is because we ended up having a new altar made, then the altar is buried where it stands. So, and so in our case, uh, the, hosp the nearby hospital bought our property, and so... Uh, the church was demolished, the building was demolished, and then the altar was buried in the ground, all right? Uh, so in that case, uh, the church is not, is not unconsecrated, and, and what is consecrated is the altar itself, all right? So, uh, so all the, the, uh, the rubble of the church was, was then removed. Some of it we used to help decorate the new church, and then when we moved into our new church, we had that church then consecrated. All righty. Um, our next, oh, well, um, a comment, Aye is my Kitty says, hello, everybody. Hope you're all having a wonderful day. You too. Followed by sudden death. <laughs> okay. Is that his handle? Yes, okay. sudden death. Do you believe that St. Anthony the Great was talking about today's time? It seems like it could be now. Uh, so, uh, well, I'm wondering which work of St. Anthony he's talking about. So if he's talking about St. Anthony, the founder of the uh, monastic movement, pretty much, I'd have to I'd have to know particularly what writings of St. Anthony he's talking about. All okay. right. Maybe they can um, write something in below. Um, we have a greeting and blessings from Damien Kuzmik. Thank and you, sir. Aaron says, good evening, everyone. How should we treat the writings of saints who have predicted events regarding the end times? Well, first off, we should start with what the Lord himself says. He said, I know neither the time nor the date. Okay? So in his, human in his divinity, he is omnipotent. But in his humanity, he says, I do not know the time or date. And what that tells us is that we should spend more time in the present, meaning what it is that we're doing today to abide in Christ and not worry so much about the end times. Because we know that those end times are coming and we know how to prepare for them and we know what we must be doing. Okay, so... So uh, how do we take those writings from the saints? We read them, but always within the context of what the Lord himself said, is that we do not know, I do not know the time nor the place. All right. Evelyn Bunt says, or asks, are catechumens allowed to have icons? Sure, absolutely, right? I mean, there's... Uh, uh, again, what we what we restrict the catechumens from is participating in the body and blood of Jesus Christ, receiving Holy Communion. But anybody can keep an icon. There's nothing wrong. There's nothing orthodox about having an icon in your house. I mean, it's a it's a it's a wonderful thing. All right, um, Migs says, "Blessed Thursday evening. What are your thoughts of the Palmarian Catholic Church?" They also claim to be the true Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church, 
and claim to have the true successor to Peter. You know, I mean, you know what, you know, uh, you know what, uh, what can we say? I mean, we're we're aware of we're aware of many uh, breakaway churches, um, but and I'm going to use a secular example here. Uh, when I was in the military, we learned that you fight the system from the inside. You fix the system from fix the system from the inside. You don't break away from it and start something new. Okay, so our answer to that would be, you know, we know what Christ established on earth. He established the established his earthly church, and he gave that to his apostles, and his apostles carried that forward, and they they then made sure that the church continued. So what we know is that we have the Church of the East and the Church of the West. That's what we know that we have from apostolic times, and that's what remains constant. Oh, real quick, Diane says as she's enjoying our YouTube shorts, they typically come out... Uh, Every Wednesday, no. it, uh, we we really uh, thank you for the feedback, and I think we shot another five today. Mm. They'll be coming out soon, uh, and prayers for Ted because he uh, has gout. Oh, oh, oh! I read that, and when I first read it, I thought she said that Ted got, got out. out. I saw that too. That's what I thought. Oh, he got like out. He, he escaped from Len. I know. I just... <laughs> they, they found him at a Pizza Hut. It was very sad. But uh, I but I do oh but uh, I do appreciate that uh, that that Ted sends me uh, some of the uh, some of the best uh, uh, religious humor that I've seen. It is uh, it is pretty funny. The last one on Earl Grey just cracked me up. Oh <laughs> yeah, that was too was funny. funny. So. <laughs> Yes. All right. And uh, Migs said, I forgot to give my address last week. Hopefully, Migs, that you sent it in. Do you have? Yep. Uh, please uh, send it in um, now. Um, A-G-O-C-N-Y. You know, I think I just, uh, it just uh, yeah. popped up here. Uh, yeah, I replied in the, in the in Oh, the you comments. did? Okay. Yeah. So. All right. And from Rebecca Shantz, if the Pope disapproves of surrogates, I assume the Orthodox do as well. Yet how can they? If Hagar was a surrogate birth mother for Abraham and Sarah's first child, adopted by Sarah, um, had she, I mean, um, had she to be barren, wouldn't this act have been approved by God, especially as she was visited by a spirit whom I heard was the Lord, and she, the first person to use his name Lord in the Bible? I Oh, and then she saw the story on YouTube. Of Hagar. No. And I didn't know that Sarah that Hagar was considered a surrogate mother though. I because thought she was just um the mother, just she's the uh concubine, I guess. Was that the what, uh, the term? Well, okay, and um uh, just give me one uh, just give me one second here. I will uh stand by. Right. Stand by stand by. Any other comments while he's looking up? Um... Yes, uh, Ruffle Stakes <laughs> is asking, is the book available now? Yes, it is. If you actually do a search on Amazon for Magos under books, it is. it, it pops up. Uh, either that or a magic trick book. It's going to be one or the other. <laughs> um, so that is that is available there. I think uh, he priced it at twelve ninety five. We tried to go yes. as low as we possibly could to cover the uh, the cost of uh, printing the book yes you know. um it's it's I, I love it when we get Old Testament questions <laughs> because it's the only time that you will see that he struggles to try to find the exact verse if, earlier you know you pull up John you, you immediately up oh, there's there's the 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 <laughs> woman of, with the anointing the oil you knew exactly where to look but Old Testament or it, it that's one of the reasons we did the virtual Sunday school series, um, a very long uh, portion on the Old Testament is uh, it rarely gets covered in Orthodoxy. And if you talk to people who have been Orthodox for, for, for their entire lives and you ask them questions, that's at least what I discovered, you ask them questions about Solomon. Or, I mean, everybody knows Noah and Adam and Eve, but it, there are so many stories in the Old mm -hmm. Testament that are just completely overlooked. Yeah. 
a ba- Balam and the Talking Donkey. Come on, that's a wacky, <laughs> crazy story. <laughs> that's right. I I enjoyed I enjoyed making that video. The animals of the Bible. That would be a great um, trivia uh, Jeopardy category. And yet, no cats. I don't no, know. no cats. I don't know. Lions. Uh, but um, uh, have you oh. found the? Um... Yeah. Uh, it, um... <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he... <laughs> but right. then again, they don't mention spotted geckos, so I mean. <laughs> well, that's true. Shall we? Uh... Okay, so what I wanted to say with regards to what you were saying about, you know, what do you consider him? So at at the time when when God asks Abraham to sacrifice his son, he says to him, um, "God tested Abraham, said to him, Abraham." Then he said, "Here I am." He says. Take now your beloved son whom you love and go there and offer him as a burnt offering. And then and then at the end, um, he says, um, uh, he says, do not lay your hand on the lad doing anything, for I know now that you fear God, and for my sake you have not spared your beloved son. Okay, so he makes um uh um Concerning his, uh, he is teaching Abraham concerning his eternal birth um, himself. So, so here we're pointing to the fact that that was considered Abraham's son. So when you say he wasn't really a surrogate, he wasn't looking for another son, then they don't consider. Uh, yes, he he was a he was fathered by Abraham, but Jesus Jesus. Well, Jesus is the voice, but God refers to Isaac as the beloved son, and that and that Ishmael comes through um, Hagar. Through Hagar, right? right. But so what I was saying was, I didn't think she was considered a surrogate mother, Hagar or Sarah, because right, because because it, uh, they uh, their son Isaac came through uh, Sarah. Okay, all right. Um, Marie Laganis, um, jointly Orthodox and Catholic, should have aimed to assist the Palestinians suffering for decades in Jesus's birthplace. So I guess that's more of a statement. A um, statement. There, there was one from Ayazma. Um, oh, did says, I miss yeah, one? I, I got it. So I'm trying to begin my conversion to Orthodoxy. Would it be better to call the priest ahead of time or just show up on Sunday? God bless. Um. Probably those of you, not probably, but those of you who have been listening to my show for any length of time knows that answer A is the correct answer. <laughs> to call ahead? Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, it's always good to give the priest a heads up. <laughs> hello, I have a question of the title father. For example, many Protestants don't tolerate people calling the pastor father. What is your argument against that? So the way I'd start that is, you know, I like to go back to the Orthodox Study Bible because it provides a very succinct answer to these questions. So what he's talking about is uh, Matthew 23 and verse 9, where he says, Do not call anyone on earth your father, for one is your father, he who is in heaven. Okay? But if we look back, right, if we go back, what we see is he's talking about the Pharisees because he says... He says, then Jesus spoke to the multitudes and his disciples, saying, saying, the scribes and the Pharisees who sit in Moses' seat, therefore, whatever they tell you to observe, that they observe and do, but do not do according to their works. Okay, for they bind heavy burdens. So he's talking about, um, it, in that case, he's talking about them as fathers and teachers. So we have to understand the context. So he's not just outright saying, don't call anybody father, because if we go back to Luke, we look in Luke 16, 24, we see, the, uh, we see Lazarus and the rich man, and he says, he cries out, Father Abraham, have mercy on them. So we see somebody calling him father, all right? But when we read in the Orthodox study notes, it says, Christ's warning against calling hypocrites fathers and teachers is not an absolute prohibition, all right? For this term applied to many people in the times of the Old and New Testament, all right? Since the early days of the church, bishops and presbyters have been called father, not because they take the place of God, but because of their fatherly care for their flocks, leading people to God, and exercising fatherly authority within the community. And didn't St. Paul himself 
use the term father? I'm your spiritual father. He, he did. And a couple of times, like in Colossians and in Corinthians, uh, he talks about actual fathers, you know, how you raise children. So that's mm -hmm. why I kind of was staying away from that one a little bit. But okay. yes, he does. All right. Um, then Maria Laganis, Marie, sorry, Laganis, um, Muslim and Jewish religious leaders have more authority in Canada. Our Christian leaders allow Christian mockery. Why isn't Christianity challenging our government from making it more difficult? I'm not sure if that's in Canada or here. Well, it, Canada or here, it doesn't. Uh, it doesn't really make. A, it doesn't really make a difference. The answer is yes. You know, we 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 should, as a church, just as the just as the uh, patri the early patriarchs of the church challenged uh, the emperors. It is our job as the church, as the guardian of the truth, to fight back against what we see that is not scripturally based or is not within the teachings of the Orthodox Church. So the answer is yes, we should be fighting back. So, and one of the things, uh, one of the things we definitely should be fighting back on is, you know, what's going to happen with the next pandemic in terms of what is the church going to say? And, and and by that, you know, I'm not making an argument here about disobeying the law, but the churches do provide a place of of sanctity, and they do provide uh, um, a a therapeutic and spiritual cure for the loneliness that we've seen that has out has come out of this first pandemic. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, we got a twenty dollars super chat from Gus, and uh, he has a question. Uh, my Catholic friend sitting here with me wants to know how close to the end uh, end of times, the rapture, I guess how close we are to the end of times or the rapture. And I guess since the word rapture is mentioned, and that's a Catholic belief, mm -hmm. does the Orthodox believe in the rapture? It's also a Protestant belief, the Pro rapture. Yes. Um, again, the, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to go with Jesus's words here, um, which is always a safe bet, right? <laughs> well, yes. <laughs> right? Um, which is, I neither know the time nor the place, all right? So, again, um, it's we're spending idle time and, I think, wasteful, wasteful time worrying about when rapture is coming. Jesus Christ tells us, I will come like a thief in the night, so be prepared. And he gives us that wonderful parable about the uh, the rich man who wanted to build, right? He says, oh, look what I'm going to build. You know, and he's thinking about what he's going to do in the future. And what Jesus tells him in the parable is, tonight your soul is being asked for. So we need to focus on today and not calculating what's going to happen in the future. I mean, every single every single generation thinks it's the end time. It's the end time. But what right. about the rapture? Um, the, uh, the rapture is, is that the one where they're all being called up into heaven and meet the, well, meet the Lord the, in the, the air? Christians, the Christians rise, um, and all that are left behind are, um, the non-Christians. No. So we don't have a, uh, we don't have a belief in the, in the rapture. Uh, we believe that, uh, we will, uh, we will all be here. So there won't be special people that will be called. Uh, again, we, we, uh, as far as being uh, all meet Jesus in uh, in the uh, in the clouds in the air again, this we can't take everything literally in the Bible. All right, so we know that there will be difficult times ahead. We know that, but we don't believe that there will be a special sparing of people so that others are left behind. Mm -hmm. All right, we have real quick three uh, consecutive questions from forty nine K. Uh, since we're in the recording phase of tonight's episode because of the internet situation, uh, let's just uh, jump uh, real quick, lightning round. Um, do I need godparents? We all need sponsors. We all need teachers. So even if we don't call them godparents, we need sponsors, those who will instruct us and guide us in the faith. Do you know anyone who became a priest without a degree? Oh yes, we have. Uh, we not lately, but yes, we. Uh, you do not have to have a degree to be a priest, and we have quite a few priest monks uh, that are in the monastery that do not have degrees. 
but uh, but will come to if their abbot decides they will come to seminary later. So you don't have to have a degree, but it is in America the standard practice. And final one: Do you need to have apostolic succession to become a priest? In the Orthodox Church, the answer is yes. All right. Well, that was quick. Um, <clears throat> from I believe it's Rodkus, if I'm seeing that correctly. Um, Bless Father, my son and I will get baptized after Pascha, God willing, but my wife will remain heterodox. Okay. Do we need to get our civil marriage blessed by my priest for me to commune, and is crowning needed? So normally the normally the blessing service does include a does include a crowning uh, a, a crowning in there. Um, so <clears throat> typically uh, typically what uh, uh, what I ask uh, is that in order for the the Orthodox to be in proper communion with the Church, that they do have their marriage blessed in the Church. Now again. The marriage, the only marriages that I can bless in the church are those that are inter-Christian. So I cannot bless an interfaith marriage, meaning uh, marriage to a Muslim or a Jew, uh, a Buddhist, so on and so forth. But inter-Christian marriages, we can do the blessing, and that typically does include the crowning. Um, did you get Marie Maria's question about Muslim and uh, Jewish religious leaders? I think, uh, yes, you, you did answer that. Okay. Uh, like one last lightning round, two more from 49K. What's the saddest moment for you in the Orthodox Church? The fact that we are not one church as Jesus Christ commanded, that we are not uh, with, our, uh, with our brother Catholic Church. And why did the Protestants not consider the apocryphal valid? So for... For mostly the same reason that, for mostly the same reason that we consider books to be apocryphal, we could not validate or verify their source, uh, meaning that who wrote it, and was and and is it essential for salvation? And that second part, is it essential for salvation, is where we tend to differ with the Protestant Church. Because there are many capital T traditions that our church has, like memorial prayers for the dead, and we find those in the apocryphal scriptures. Also, in the apocryphal scriptures, we find many cases where we see Christ prefigured in those Old Testament writings. Okay. Um, from Zach Cooney. What is the Orthodox position on LGBTQ? That they that that they are created in the image and likeness of God, and that we should extend our love, our compassion, and our mercy to everyone. But there are certain aspects of the LGBT community that the Orthodox Church cannot accept. All right. Um, from PF Stats, I'm trying to figure out um, exactly what the question is, um, if I'm reading it right. Um, some Russians venerate Stalin, it says to have an icon. I don't know if it means with an icon. Since he helped to martyr 10 million Orthodox, some say it's a good thing. Most don't benefit from Orthodoxy in life, so were they right to perish? And no, we are not, we, you know, um, we are not, uh, evil is not called into the world to give us the opportunity to martyr ourselves. And evil exists in the world because the prince of the, 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 the prince of darkness, who is Satan, still rules this world. Now, ultimately, through Christ's resurrection, he has lost that battle, but he is still the ruler of this world. All right. And through that, evil and sin, you know, has, you know, he has, um, uh, with sin and death entering into the world, he has now taken advantage of that and has, and has darkened us. So from that standpoint, it is not, it, it is not that as 
St. Paul says, should evil abound so that goodness can prevail? No, of course not. But evil does prevail, and those who stand up for Christ and are martyred for that are our examples. But we don't, we never venerate those who have given martyrs the opportunity to martyr themselves. All right. Um, the next one's an interesting one from W.S. Um, in 1790, a Greek married George Washington's wife's daughter, and the priest from Greece gave him a note to give to a Protestant priest to get communion in a Protestant church since there was no Orthodox church? Question mark. So was there, when was the first Orthodox church um, here? Is that Louisiana? Is that the first one? The, um, well, technically, the first one was in Florida, but, you know, it was uh, it, it quickly, uh, they, I think they all died. But the first, um, uh, the first parish that is continuous up on today was in, uh, was in Louisiana, correct? And was that post-1790? So is that true Ugh. that there was a... Uh, um, well, I, I know that, I, I, I don't know that particular story, but I do know that uh, one of the founding fathers had related the story of attending an Orthodox baptism. Hmm. So, so, but that happened in the 1800s. Oh, so have you ever heard this, that George Washington's stepdaughter married a Greek? No, I had not, uh, not heard oh, that. I guess it was his stepdaughter. I don't think he had... It, oh. it seems that it would have been after 1790. Um, of course, if you um, ignore the fact that uh, in 1741, the Divine Liturgy apparently was celebrated on a Russian ship off the coast of Alaska. But, you know, that's... That's uh, where you go from Alaska to Florida, you one end to, to, to the, the other, other. <laughs> New Smyrna Beach in 1767. But I guess the um, the question seems to be um, the, the key point of this question is, is that the priest from Greece gave a permission for a Protestant, um, uh, to a Protestant priest to get. To, to, to administer the, communion. Yeah, to administer communion. That's uh, I'd like to uh, I'd like to you know kind of maybe read a little bit more about mm -hmm. that. If has, that's an interesting. Has there been any other case where something like that has been accepted? Um, not for not that I'm aware of for communion. I mean, I I know that I know that uh, that our bishop has has uh, you know has granted me permission that if somebody dies. Um, you know, in an in a town that there is no Orthodox church, that I have been able to conduct the funeral service in a Protestant church, typically. All right, uh, but no, I do not know of any cases today uh, where where the uh, the Protestant minister is administering communion. We'll look into George Washington for next week. <laughs> All right, um, Carol Weaver asks: Is cremation permissible? I did not think it was, but maybe I'm wrong. No, uh, no it is not uh, permissible. Um, on our website, um, under uh, under education catechism, in the last session, session ten, I believe, ten or nine, uh, it says end of life decisions, and in there I have an article on why we do not accept cremation. Okay. And uh, furthermore, we have a couple of videos on our website about, um, and, uh, on oh, YouTube yeah, about Yeah, that. we do have that on our website, too. 49K, have you personally performed an exorcism? No. No, I have not, <laughs> and I have no plans to perform an exorcism. <laughs> Don't you want to do one live on the show? No. Come on. Well, that <laughs> would get the numbers. <laughs> that, that would. That, I wouldn't believe a second of it. If you, no. if you ever see an exorcism on anyone's live stream, it's not real. Exactly. And I would be too afraid. Anybody should be too afraid to do it. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Oh, I my mean... goodness. All right. Uh, Maria, Marie Laganas, my relatives in Athens inform me they no longer teach religion in elementary schools for equality. I thought the gr Greek majority was Orthodox Christianity. Is that true? They don't. They no longer teach religion. 
Uh, I th- I think that I did I did hear that that uh, that they are that they have separated that out and they're becoming more American in that sense I, that they do not teach religion. I thought when they joined the European Union, that was the first thing that popped in my head. Yeah. That's the first that's going to go right is yes. uh, that okay. that acceptance of separation of church I and state. I'm not surprised. Um, PF stats. Some Orthodox say a person will be judged by if they meant well than doing well. Is that true? Since isn't the road to hell paved with good intentions? That's, uh, 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 again, that's exactly the saying. So you, uh, you, uh, you are not judged on what you thought you should do. You are judged on what it is that you eventually did. And we have those words clearly uh, in Judgment Sunday, where he says, if you did not do them to the least of them, then you did not do it unto me. And if you did it to the least of them, then you also did it unto me. So he's very clear on that. Jesus uh, is. All right. From Nancy, my husband and I just read the book of Tobit for the first time. We were both raised Protestant before joining an Orthodox church, recently joining. I understand why Sarah's first seven husbands died, But I would be curious about any theories as to why there were seven. I understand that she was a beautiful heiress, but one would think that after the first two or three deaths, her phone would never ring again. (laughs) (laughs) So, uh, you know, and uh, and it's been a while since I've read the book of of Tobit, but when they say the the wives uh, talking about the um, the the, they're talking about the wife there, huh? Right. Well, she lost seven husbands, but she's like she, the question is why? Um, as why there were seven, and isn't seven one of the key numbers that is found very, very often in the Bible? Um, isn't there a significance? Yes, yeah, there's the a sig- there's seven? a significance to uh, there's significance to seven. Yes, five sixty six. I'm just kind of curious here. Five. See, now we but definitely need the music. <laughs> she said Tobit, right? Yes. The father sends his only son into the world he may find a bride and save her and bring her back, rejoining the sit. Uh but from my understanding, numbers isn't isn't seven a uh one of the holy numbers, something it means it something about being complete? No, that well the uh, the, the completion is eight. Isn't it like the perfect number? Because there were seven jars at the wedding of Cana. Right. Uh, right. But I thought the uh, I thought the the completion is eight. That's the eighth mm-hmm. day. Is you know uh, when when uh, when everything is reconciled back to God. You know, I just looked it up, and they say that seven is complete. So I wonder if that's an Orthodox thing that our perspective is eight is the completeness. Yeah, because that uh, that Sunday, the resurrection day, is the eighth day. It's when it's when it's when. God's will has been fulfilled. I just know that the answer definitely isn't because there are seven Harry Potter books. That's yeah. there we go. <laughs> but but that's it. That's interesting about the breaks uh, um, the curse. So yeah, I'm just I don't know where um, where there's seven husbands. Okay. I guess I got to read that. You want to look that up and have that for next week? Yeah, I guess so. Right. All right. Then we can move on to the next question. You'll come back with the answer. Um, So from Miggs, what is the difference then if a metropolitan can make a decision for his church compared to when when does the church need all the patriarchs to agree? Is that for dogma only? Yes, that is is correct. So the, uh, the, the local bishop makes determinations about how the church functions will operate in his geographical area within the confines of the of the canons of the church and the seven ecumenical councils but if new dogma is going to be taught then it must be uh it 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 must be um uh, uh canonized by the uh by all of the five patriarchates okay 
Um, Carol Weaver says, Mary of Bethany was always at, <clears throat> excuse me, at Christ's feet. Could that be who the Mary was? And the, the answer is yes. Since we don't know the identity, yes, it could be. <laughs> All right. Um, Greek 70s asks, is it okay to go to church before anyone is in to light a candle and then go home and hear the service online? It's, well, you'd have to break in if no one's in. I mean, you know, I, I look. I have, you know, I do have, but uh, I, I do have that happen from time to time. That uh, you know, I'll be, you know, Terry and I will be one of the first ones that are here, uh, and somebody will just, you know, come in before the service begins, and they'll want to light a candle, but you know, they have to go back to the restaurant or worker. So if they have a valid reason, you know. Why? I mean, I guess, you know, I can offer economia. So they want to come in, they want to light a candle because of, for some reason, but then there is a, there is a requirement that they have. If they're a, a nurse or a doctor or whatever it is, then, then they have to leave. Okay. But if it's just somebody, that's a difficult one because if, if you're already in church and you light the candle and then you say, well, no, you know what? Eh, this is too much. I'm going to go back home where I can relax on the couch and I can watch the live stream from there. You've already shown that you've made the sacrifice to come and be in God's house. But now you're going to turn away from that and you're going to go back to your own house. So complete the sacrifice that you've made and stay for the service. What if it's health reasons? Like say somebody is going through... Uh maybe chemo treatments. I'm not sure whether they would do that with chemo treatments, but let's say it's something like that. They're going through medical treatments and they can't be around a lot of people. Or they've got an immune... Okay, mm -hmm. again, I understand those those types of things, okay. but if it's just a case of I just want to be more comfortable at home, then no. Okay. Yeah, but lighting a candle, I mean, and that's the next question, well, uh, part of the purpose of that, but lighting a candle is insignificant in comparison to receiving Holy Communion. So if you're going to come in for something... Right, come in for right, come in for holy communion. But like I said, I do know that some people, because of restaurant or things like that, or being a doctor, that you know it's important for them to light the candle, but they just can't stay. So I, you know, I, I get that. But you're right. You know, uh, lighting a candle in no way compares with receiving the body and blood of Jesus Christ. And so the second question is, what is the purpose of lighting a candle? So there is. And in the churches, uh, in the in the, uh, the 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 church's overall um, scheme of things, if I could use that word, there are two purposes, right? There's always the sim there's always the reality that is couched in symbolism. All right, so the symbolism is that you like the candle, so that you can offer specific prayers that that at the moment are important to you, whether those are prayers for somebody's health, prayers for your health, prayers for prayers for peace, that your marriage can be reconciled, um, that um, that you can get along better with your coworkers, whatever that is, that candle as the light of Christ represents the fact that your prayers are being lifted up and that you are getting some peace from being able to be silent, to hear what the answer is from God. What the practical reason is, is the Orthodox Church has long realized that the minute that you enter the door from the outside world, that's not what you're thinking about. What you're thinking about is what you want to have for breakfast, maybe the fight that you got in with your brother, your sister, or your wife, or husband, or whatever it is. And so you need time to decompress. So the church gives you something to do. And so they give you the candle and they tell you that you should say a prayer so that by the time you finish that activity, by the time you walk into the church, you your mind has begun the transition from the outside world to now the spiritual. All right. And then why are there more men saints than women saints? I don't know. Were there more men at that it, time? It, uh, I don't know about that. I don't know. <laughs> I, I... Oh, definitely cultural position and geography has a lot to do with that. 
I mean, you know, and because I certainly don't want to use the idea of sexism that, well, you know, the orth the uh, the Orthodox Church only thought that uh, that you know men could be saints, and that's nothing further from the truth. Because you know, from the beginning of uh, f from the beginning of Christ's ministry, women have always been present. So we can't say that well, we're we're a hierarchical, um, in, uh, sorry, we're a patriarchal church, and so uh, you I mean, know, look women at all the Marys. Right. That we listen look, to look, this episode. look at all the uh, you know look at all the right. Um, so you know what I don't I don't know what the count is. You know, men versus women. I don't know what that that's that's an interesting uh, idea. Is what is the count of men versus women mm -hmm. saints? And there could be a lot of women saints that we've aren't remember we're not remembering anymore. Could be they've um, perhaps faded. So I don't, we'll have to look that up. That's a good homework assignment. All right. Um, from Sky's the Limit, what are your thoughts on the, it's H-O-C-N-A churches? H-O-C-N-A. Would it be Holy oh. Orthodox Church? North America? <laughs> I don't know what that is. H-O-C-N-A. It's the Holy Orthodox Church in North America. It's a true Orthodox denomination located primarily in the United States and Canada with additional communities in Latin America, Europe, Africa, and Georgia. Um, this question require if uh, <laughs> if you didn't know off the top of your head, I believe yeah. this question will require a little bit more research. Yeah. So sky's yeah. the limit. We'll get back to you next week because we have a lot more questions. And due to the fact that uh, we lost the internet tonight, we're going to try to get through um, through all of them. Oh, geez. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, from Marcello or Marcello. Um, what should we do to receive the blessing to be able to commune? I have heard we need to have a confession, but I'm scared that I will be judged by the priest and the priest exposing my confession. We have a short coming out next week. Uh, just, uh, just about that. Funny enough. So, you know, look, I can, I can understand the the practicality of your reasoning. Okay, it is a very difficult thing. It's a very, very difficult thing to. Uh, to expose yourself in that way, to stand, you know, uh, 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 figuratively naked before somebody else confessing your sins. Okay, so my answer to that is get to know the priest, all right, so that you can establish a relation. You don't have to start your relationship with the priest with confession, all right? So what you have to get to know is, is you know, what is... How is this priest uh, treating his parishioners? Does he treat them with compassion? You know, is he um, is is he a very harsh judge? Um, does he have experience in how to handle confessions? How does he react in the community, and what is his personality there? So, one, he you have to get to know him as a person. The next thing is that you have to get that he has to get to know you as a person so that he can have some context behind what it is that you're saying to him. So what I'm saying is don't start your initial relationship with the priest with confession, but spend some time in the community and get to know who the priest is and let the priest get to know you. And then that will, I guarantee you, that that will take away your inhibitions about speaking to him. All right. From 49K, I've drawn some icons. Do you know what I can do with this type of hobby? Yes, that, that's, a, that's a beautiful and a, and a, and a grace-filled hobby to have. Uh, and you can turn that, I don't, and I, I don't want to say turn it into a profession, and I don't want to say a hobby, but what you, can call, what you can turn that into is a calling. The Orthodox Church is always looking for iconographers, so what you can do is take that to the next level and maybe study in a monastery that if you're lucky enough to have a monastery near you, you can study in a monastery. If you don't have a monastery near you, there are many, there are many uh, smaller, uh, sorry, there are many Orthodox church and monasteries around our country that on a regular basis hold iconography classes. So I would encourage you to take that to the next level and then perfect your skill in iconography because the church can always use uh, and uh, always use a prayerful and a talented iconographer. All right. From Sandra Laganis, 
Did Holy Mary have other children with Joseph? We, uh, we, uh, w the Orthodox Church would say no, is that the brothers of our Lord were those who were, we say, stepbrothers, right, of Jesus through Joseph. But we do not believe, we as the Orthodox Church, do not believe that Mary had other children um, uh, after, uh, after Jesus, um, that, uh, that she remained ever virgin. Um, Aaron said, I, we know we have crosses to carry, and sometimes God will allow for certain things to happen, but for many, sometimes things become quite heavy. How do I help someone who is suffering understanding that God has not abandoned them? Hmm. I'm, I'm taking, my, taking my time here because uh, what calls out to us in in this type of in this in this type of depression uh are the words of Jesus Christ on the uh on the cross when he says my god my god why have you forsaken me and so that cry is that cry of humanity because there are times when people feel that that they have been forsaken all right but we as orthodox never believe and it is never our theology that God turned his back on his son, okay? So from that, our theology is that, that Christ is always with us. He says, know that I will be with you always until the end of the age. So if we are suffering under a burden, then there is a purpose behind that. And, and I don't want to say that we are being tested because then it makes... It makes God look dispassionate. But there are trials that we will go through because we are, tr we are in a sinful and a death-filled world. And through that, that, that illness and disease, we will suffer. But Christ has promised that, we, that he will be with us and that that's when we find out what our true strength is. Why? Because we discover how weak we are but how strong we become in Jesus. I don't just say those words lightly. I say them because I have experienced them in visiting many people who have had debilitating illnesses, but have kept their faith through that illness. And many times that illness isn't lifted from them and they carry it, but they know that Jesus Christ is there to help them through that trial, but not because God has tested them. All right. Um, the next one, is from K did it goes on, but I don't know how to say that. So, um, could you all pray for me? I've had a bad flu for four days and haven't slept much at all. Please pray for my fast recovery as I have been bed bound. So, and we, at this time of great Lent, we offer that our Lord's Lord and savior, Jesus Christ, who is the true physician of our souls, guide you and strengthen you so that you may uh, you may um uh, you may be able to be present in his holy passion to to journey in his holy passion and also to celebrate his resurrection and uh cooking for bebug wants to know if you received uh their email regarding the prize they won last last uh last yes week. i did week. and yes i did and in fact i was waiting to get a couple of the other addresses uh it looks like i've got to the three addresses right now so i'm gonna have lena our secretary send that out first thing next week beautiful right. okay kitimishk do you mind telling me what the navy book is under your laptop on display oh the navy Oh, the Navy book. It's this a book. photo album. <laughs> oh, I thought it was a no. naval book. We, no, no, we, we tried to make it easier for Presbyterian to be able to see the yes. computer. Today. Well, yeah. I discovered that I look like I'm always asleep on the camera because I'm looking down. So I was hoping that I wouldn't look quite so... Uh... Sure, don't let us bore you, Presbyterian. <laughs> so it's hopefully to make it look better. I don't know if it's working, but... Um... That's the uh, photos from our last golf outing. Well, that would put me to sleep. <laughs> Okay, from 49K, last, one last thing for sure this time. <laughs> Why doesn't the church evangelize? 
Uh, yeah, and this is very similar to a uh, to a question that we had earlier, and uh, that I have that same uh, I have that same issue. Why doesn't our church evangelize more? I know that there's work that we're doing, okay, but we do need to have a much larger voice in terms of what's what's going on in the world, and. Again, that's not to say that we're supposed to be marching in protest or anything like that. That's not to say that. But the church does need to state her position clearly on these world issues. Our, the history of our Orthodox Church has been, as I mentioned before, that our, patri our patriarchs always confronted the emperor when he was acting in a way that was not proper in our Christian faith. So they were always not only evangelizing, but they were always, um, uh, when you're, oh, what's the what's the more proper term for when you're in somebody's face about something? <laughs> uh, confronting them or... Uh, um, I mean, confronting. Yeah, technically, but there's, but there's, a, there's a specific word for that, uh, that, that uh, not accusing, uh, but they're... Uh, they're holding them accountable for their actions. And so that's what the church needs to do. So so many times when we've had uh, these issues come up, we've seen the, the patriarch of Jerusalem, or whatever that issue is, not just the issues that we're having between the Arab-Israeli, the, uh, the uh, yes, the, the, uh, the Palestinian and Israeli conflicts right now, all right. It's not just that, but there's many other times where we've seen where when we've seen other patriarchs, Orthodox patriarchs have published something, and we need to be sure that we're also having that message. Now, maybe we are saying that message, but it's hidden somewhere. So it just need to we need to be much more visual and much not so much more vocal because we, I believe we are vocal, but much more visual about being able to show what our positions are. Okay. Um, Mike says, what are your thoughts about a child that was baptized by a person who converted to orthodoxy for the baptism, but years later admitted they lied and didn't mean what they said at the conversion? Well, that, uh, that certainly sounds like confession material that, uh, would have to be uh, when I say investigated, I mean that we would have to examine what are the current motivations, okay? So we can't just, I mean, what they've done, they've already done. What we have to decide now is if they are coming forward and saying, I lied under my initial chrismation or baptism or whatever it is, but now I'm, I want to repent for what I did, we have, to, we have to look at where they are right now and not worry so much about what happened in the past. And that wouldn't affect the child. In this, in the case of the baptism, it's not the child. Oh, I thought I thought it was the person was like an adult being baptized and no, said it was that. a child being oh. baptized. I think that they mean the sponsor. Oh, the that, sponsor that had converted that didn't really mean. Oh, yeah. But that so, should also but that, be investigated. That has to be said. right. That has to be yeah. in, investigated for what is their current motivation right now. I mean, their motivation in that particular case was being the godfather. I guess the godfather figure. Yeah, but but again, we have to, you know, and I've Which is I've, missing the point. What's that? That it's missing the point of being a godfather. The it, it is, but there's a there's a deeper issue here that remember in Orthodox theology, you stand before God not only for what you have done, but what you have failed to do for those who you have said are gonna be under my spiritual care. So, you know, there is, there is a consequence to that, and it's a severe consequence because you will be judged for what it is that you failed to do. Now, maybe, maybe uh, you know, that uh, you didn't believe any of those things, so you didn't really pay any attention to your godchild. You'll be judged for that. Or if you taught them heretical or erroneous things, you will be judged for that. Okay, so this is why repentance now is so important because of what you may or may not have done to that child. All right, and Car this is the last question. Oh, is this the last one? Yeah. All right. 
Um, Carol Weaver, do you have an infinity with your godparents and the priest or bishop or abbot that baptized you and took part in this part of the journey? Is this a lifelong spiritual connection? It's supposed to be, yes, absolutely. It uh, you, This connection is supposed to be for life because you are there to all, to be present in the child's life to help them grow spiritually, but equally so, you're also supposed to be there as they grow into adulthood and they have issues or problems and they need somebody to come to for spiritual guidance, and that's the priest and that's the godparent. Hmm. And then Carol Weaver says, I think you know you're doing the work of the Lord when Satan is upset and causes problems with technology or in other ways, then you just stay strong and pray harder. <laughs> yeah, well, we got a lot. A lot of people were were in uh, giving us, um, giving us, you know, some a pat on the back regarding these tech issues. And like I said before, um, we always have this issue right before Holy Week. Yeah. Well, that's she said yeah. it right there. Yeah. She, 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 she said it right there. It's and it's a hundred percent true. But we don't let the demons win because we have recorded this. Demos is going to put it up, and we're going to we have the show regardless. We have your questions. We've given you the answers. So Christ will prevail. They know what my motto is. The Come show on, must go on. Well, yeah, but I tell you this all the time. Always have a backup. Always for your have backup. a backup plan. <laughs> no, you always tell me. Always have a backup plan for the backup that's, plan. That's exactly it. Always have a backup for the backup. And in this case, we always record our shows for reasons like this. Uh, either way, um, we we will investigate and try to have this resolved uh once again in the rush right before right before holy week i think there was uh, one incident two years ago where i made there were about what five truck, spectrum trucks, trucks outside right <laughs> right. <laughs> right the right before holy week it's um yeah it is what it is but once again thank you all for your support um and we will be back uh well tomorrow actually or since I posted yeah, this we're going to be early. we're going to be live back three, later tonight eight. for the Akathis mm -hmm. to the Theotokos. Yeah, well, I use I use Makiti. You said elevator music or something like that would be really appropriate right now while we were waiting. We should have played um, "Memory Eternal" to Dickie Betts, fantastic guitarist for the Allman Brothers oh. and songwriter. He wrote "Jessica" and "Blue Sky" amongst others. He will be greatly missed and. Uh, so memory eternal for him. He passed away today. Yeah, we were listening to him on the way over here. Yes, we were. Mm -hmm. yes. All right. Well, I guess uh, we'll see you all tonight, and we'll see you next week for episode 174. That's right. <laughs> That'll be our last episode, uh, then Holy Week, and then we'll resume after that. We'll resume while 175. You'll give out some of your books. Ooh, oh, there we go. There's yeah. something we could do. I get it. All, all right. right. Everybody have a great night. For Jadetta, once again, thank you very much. All right. Good night, everybody. Good night. Night.